the vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellors, members of the governing council, the deans of faculties, heads of departments, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, lions and lionesses. Let me first start by saying that I am delighted and indeed honored to present a lecture to this August Assembly of Eminent Personalities, among whom are renowned scholars. Being an alumnus of this great institution, the University of Nigeria, I am deeply, deeply delighted and nostalgic at the opportunity to return to my alma mater on the occasion of the second homecoming of the Department of Economics of this great institution. As I heartily appreciate the opportunity of reconnecting with my alma mater, I'd like to especially thank the Pro Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, members of the Governing Council, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, the Head of the Department of Economics, and the organizers of this event for the rare privilege to address this distinguished assembly. Before I proceed, let me affirm that the University of Nigeria is making giant strides with significant contributions in diverse fields of human endeavor. I'm delighted that the university has continued to produce a cream of creative, innovative, and well-created alumni set to become peacesetters in this globally competitive space. Your educational curriculum, training capacity, application for cutting edge technologies, and commitment to capacity building and development are indeed commendable and globally recognized. Let me particularly commend our teaming academic community here who have shown the temptations to emigrate to see greener pastures either abroad or move to the private sector in the craze to acquire wealth to meet private needs. We recognize and appreciate your sacrifice. On our part, the CPN has and will continue to play its part in contributing to the educational sector through its interventions. The CPN is currently at the verge of completing and commissioning its first set of centers of excellence at the University of Nigeria and Soka, the Amadou Bello University, and the University of Ibadan. <laughs> Today's discourse when I said that the plan is to help stimulate the quality of education through research at the postgraduate levels and facilities that will provide that will be provided at these centers of excellence, I must tell you will be second to none in terms of learning and training for our students. Today's discourse comes to comes at a time when Nigeria is undergoing structural transformation and challenges instigated by both exogenous and endogenous developments. Given the intensity of these shocks, we have seen considerable deterioration in key macroeconomic indices as Nigerians grown under the adverse effects of the adjustments in response to the underlying shocks. As the convenience of this event have magnanimously granted me the discretion to speak on a topic of my choice 
around the next thing. I'll focus my talk on the dilemma of policy making amidst complicated and compelling choices in Nigeria. Accordingly, I have titled my presentation The Dilemma of Monetary Policy and Exchange Rate Management in a Recession Potential Options for Nigeria. <clears throat> this title stems from the fact that one of the least appreciated problems which confront policymakers during times of recession is the amount of trade off that are inherent in the dynamics of key macroeconomic variables. These trade offs create a dilemma for policymakers who are forced to conjure a pecking order that reflects a scale of preference and opt for policies with the highest social net benefits. Accordingly, in today's lecture, I will briefly apprise us of the main causal effects, causal factors that lead, that led to the current economic condition as the spillover linkages into our economy. <coughs> I will also discuss the efforts of the CBN in dealing with these developments and proper policy options that can ameliorate the adverse consequences and return on a path of stable non-inflationary growth led by sustainable job creation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, discussions and debates on appropriate exchange rate policy in the context of the experience of economic recession in Nigeria are continuing. This is important because fluctuations in exchange rate whether you speak about depreciation or appreciation, have great consequences on output, inflation, and other components of aggregate demand, which directly impact the welfare of the ordinary man in a consumption and import-driven economy like ours. For the first time in 27 years, the Nigerian economy plunged into recession, likely due to negative global shocks. We are all aware that when an economy is in recession, entrepreneurs in the private sector are challenged to think creatively and innovatively. It is always difficult to restart production and grow the economy sustainably during recessions. Hence, it is not uncharacteristic for revolutionary ideas to emerge during recessions to identify effective and sustainable ways to do things differently. It is important to say that economic recession is a most undesirable, undesirable condition and policymakers detest being confronted by such conditions given the challenges in dealing with them. Economic recession reflects a general slowdown in economic activity. The technical indicator being two consecutive quarters of negative growth in real gross domestic product. Primarily, economic recessions occur due to a general fall in aggregate demand owing to a number of factors including financial crisis, credit crunch caused by high interest rates, reduced purchasing power arising from high inflation, low income, declines in asset prices as well as uncertainty and weak consumer and business confidence related to general economic conditions. Nigeria's current economic crisis had its roots in the external sector. Following the continuous slide in crude oil prices since the second half of 2020, 
was characterized by the great commodity crisis, weak aggregate demand, and volatility, volatility in the global financial market, all of which heightened macroeconomic instability. The fall in oil prices in particular had weighed heavily on the economy through more aggression to external reserves, depreciation of the Naira, and capital flow reversals. The weakening fiscal position transmitted to poor infrastructure financing, low spending capacity, high unemployment, high poverty rates, contracted output, and rising prices. Ladies and gentlemen, this recession could further be traced to a long-standing culture of underinvestment in domestic productive capacity, lending itself to, to decayed infrastructure, worsening conditions for doing business in the country, and the challenge of persuading the deposit for the banks to channel credit to the real sector of the economy. Consequently, monetary authorities were faced with the reality of fashioning out an appropriate exchange strategy to achieve price and financial system stability and restart growth. The issues around the foreign exchange market management in the period leading up to the economic recession include the low foreign exchange earnings of the economy and how to increase the supply of foreign exchange to the economy. There was no quick fix to the foreign exchange scarcity problem as supply remained essentially a function of exports and the investment climate all of which had significantly deteriorated in this period of recession, in this period of recession. As I have said at other fora, I am not unaware of the seeming unpopularity of some decisions taken by the Central Bank of Nigeria in response to the crisis. But this room of this hall is full of brilliant scholars, I mean professors and leaders, who understand that leadership is not a popularity contest. Though a lot of acclaimed economic and financial experts agree with our stance, a number of analysts hold divergent views and opinion. But I am not surprised at the lack of consensus. This is because the dilemma of policy making warrants that reasonable people can and indeed will always reach different opinions even if they have identical information. Against this premise, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me briefly explain the macroeconomic and geopolitical context in which the CBN and the country have been operating. Over the last three years, the global economy was rocked by three momentous shocks. The first, the wind-up of quantitative easing in the United States, which ended a monthly injection of $85 billion into the U.S. economy and the global financial markets. Second, the widespread geopolitical tensions. Here we're talking about geopolitical tensions arising from Russia annexing Crimea and then Ukraine, or geopolitical tensions either between Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, all these geopolitical tensions know that alter the flow of capital between emerging frontiers and developed markets. And third, the collapse of commodity price, including gold, steel, cocoa, crude oil, as in Nigeria, and etc. In particular, developments in the international oil 
power market exposed the fundamental vulnerabilities of oil export in countries like Nigeria as commodity export in countries generally endure unfavorable conditions. Consequently, the global economic performance since the mid of 2014 has been less than envisaged with medium-term outlook remaining very fragile. The Nigerian economy officially slipped into recession after the second quarter of 2016, the GDP dipped by minus 2.06%. The growth rate declined by 1.7%. Percentage points compared with the contraction of 0.36% recorded in the preceding quarter and lowered by 4.41 percentage points compared with the growth rate of 2.35% recorded in the corresponding quarter of 2015. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, the Nigerian economy recorded its lowest growth rate in three decades. The poor economic activity generally reflected a sharp contraction in the oil sector due to the continued effects of crude oil prices owing to supply cloth among OPEC members and no production arising from militancy and pipeline vandalism in the Niger Delta region of, the, of Nigeria. The signals for impending economic recession were quite obvious before the first quarter of 2016. A careful look at the growth parameters in various sectors of the economy since 2011 indicated that the economy had been, had been slowing steadily. In the mining sector, for example, the deceleration started in the third quarter of 2011 when it recorded a negative growth rate of negative 3.24%. With the exception of the third quarter of 2012, second quarter of, and the fourth quarter of 2014, and the third quarter of 2015, the economy recorded negative, negative quarterly growth rates in almost 17 quarters. Similarly, the deceleration started in the manufacturing sector during the first quarter of 2014 and persisted until the first quarter of 2015. In the services sector, the deceleration started in the second quarter of 2015 until the economy went into a full blown recession. Another complicated feature of the recession is the intensifying inflationary pressures, thus conforming to the phenomenon of stagflation. All items, including core and food inflation rates, which have remained relatively stable for most of 2014 and 2015, all started rising since the beginning of 2016. A closer look at the data shows that during the era of relatively low inflation rates, food inflation rates tended to be highest. The lowest inflation was core inflation. However, during the era of rising inflation, especially from April 2016, core inflation rose faster and higher than food inflation. These data summarizes evidence that the signs of shift in the aggregate supply curve in Nigeria have been visible since 2011, with the downward trend in the growth of mining, many oil and gas, sector GDP. When this trend spread to the manufacturing sector in 2014, it became manifest in aggregate gross domestic product growth rate by the third quarter of 2014. By the time the trend spread 
Secretary to the Service Sector in 2015, being the dominant contributor to GDP, the shift in aggregate supply curve had become so pronounced that the economy then entered into a full blown recession from the second quarter of 2016. The shift in the aggregate supply curve was accompanied by a rise in unemployment, especially between the fourth quarter of 2014 and third quarter of 2016. However, inflationary pressures increased significantly during 2016, thus completing this requirement for full blown stagflation in Nigeria. The dwindling external reserves on account of the lower crude oil prices, as well as rising capital outflows, also created an environment for sub subdued economic activity. In view of the headwinds heralded by the sharp drop in oil prices, the CBA witnessed a significant decline in FX reserves from about $42.8 billion in January 2014 to about $23.7 billion in October 2016, before recovering to slightly over $31 billion today. In terms of influence, the bank's FX earnings have fallen from as high as $3.2 billion monthly sometime in 2013 to as low as 580 million per month at some point in 2016. Indeed, sometime in 2016, precisely about October 2016, it actually fell below 500 million dollars monthly. Despite these outcomes, the demand for foreign exchange has risen significantly. In 2005, when oil prices stood at about $50 a barrel for an extended period of time, a monthly average import bill was 12.4 billion naira. In stark contrast, the average import bill in the first five months of 2017 is about 588.1 billion naira a month. This is regardless of the fact that through our efforts, we have thrown our various policies, money to reduce the monthly average import bill from almost $6 billion per month. Here you are talking about about 1.8 trillion per month in 2014 to the current level of $2 billion per month. The effect of the aforementioned exogenous shocks, especially the fall in oil prices and the capital flows reversals due to monetary policy normalization in the United States, have deteriorated for much of our economic indicators. Hence, for the first time in about 27 years, GDP growth rate was dived into negative territory as the economy actually shrank in 2016. Inflationary pressures, though moderating, is still unacceptably high, being within double digit zone, while the Naira dollar exchange rate has lost nearly 50% of its value. To contain these challenges, the CBN took a number of countervailing policy actions, both at management and, and at the monetary policy committee level, aimed at constantly fine-tuning the outcomes. For instance, in order to avoid further depletion in external reserves, the CBN determines the flexibility of the FX market while concomitantly prioritizing the most critical needs for foreign exchange. With restricted access to the foreign exchange market for 41 category of commodities, which we rationalized as unnecessary drains to our FX reserves. Having initially allowed two adjustments 
between November 2014 and June 2016, which resulted in the movement of the Naira dollar exchange rate from 155 to 197 Naira to the dollar. The CPM managed to raise around 197 Naira to the dollar for 16 months and availed the highly limited foreign exchange to meet the following needs. Mature letters of credit from commercial banks, importation of raw materials, plants and equipment, importation of petroleum products, and payments for school fees, business travel and personal travel, and related expenses. Although we made some progress from these policies, the pressure on the foreign exchange market continued to swell. With the rate at 197 naira to the dollar, and the premium vis-a-vis -vis the unstructured markets widening, there were indications that the autonomous FX suppliers were hesitant as they perceived the pricing to be inappropriate. The CBN thus in June 2016 announced the introduction of a more flexible exchange rate regime with a view to eliminating FX market pressure, void autonomous FX inflows and preserve the FX results. To support small scale users and encourage increased FX inflows from diaspora remittances, the bank also undertook the licensing of international money transfer organizations. More importantly, however, in order to further extricate the lingering bottlenecks, increase transparency and boost supply in the FX market, the CPI in April 2017 introduced the Special Investors and Exporters FX window. The establishment of that special window has tremendously facilitated market freedom transactions and has, and has catered for the FX needs of investors and exporters, exporters of FX. As a result, we have seen an appreciably improved FX supply due to the introduction of the window. So far, about $3.5 billion of foreign exchange inflow has been recorded through this window since April 2017. As we continue to fine-tune our FX policies and operations, we are cognizant that few remaining rent seekers and currency betters are keen to rebuild their collapsing businesses, even at the expense of our common wealth and the collaborative well-being of every Nigerian. This is why we have recently embarked on an aggressive drive to close the gap between the interbank and the parallel market rate, the result of which is evident to all to discern. The CPM will continue to monitor evolving situations and consistently review its policies to ensure the best outcomes for Nigeria and the Nigerian economy. Ladies and gentlemen, I must confess that though we have been unjustly castigated, especially by disparagers who do not generally have the interest of Nigeria at heart, we remain certain that the actions we have taken are indeed apt to set our economy on the path of sustainable development in the medium to long term. Looking at the size and structure of our import bills and taking cognizance of the fact that imports are a leakage to every economy, it is apparent that we as a people cannot continue to depend on other countries for things or goods or products that can easily be produced locally. How do we justify the importation of items like eggs, apples, and cucumber from South Africa? I mean, at the point, Nigeria was importing 20 million eggs per day from South Africa. At the point, People were, 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 were spending foreign exchange as high as $500,000 importing apples from 
South Africa, beef from Zambia, and toothpick from China. In the 70s and 80s, here at Nsuka, eggs and chicken were consumed by students. Eggs, I mean eggs and chicken that were consumed by students in this refectory were being produced here on campus. The bread and beef that were consumed here in Margaret Echo Hall were being produced here on campus. What happened? I only try to recall the nostalgia. On Sundays, when we're always looking forward to going to the refectory on Sundays, you know what happens on Sunday lunch? We have jollof rice. We have delicious jollof rice. Chicken is cut in half. That's chicken cut in two parts. One part of chicken is put on your plate with jollof rice. You have, if we had orange juice in this refectory, we had ice cream for lunch in this refectory. After, after eating, you came to a refectory with your job. You will collect chocolate drink, right? And take it to your, to your room and drink. Remember, you know that. It happened here. How much was this? 50 cobble. 50 cobble. So what happened? As I entered this hall, I look at the roof. I look at the fan. I look at these fluorescent tubes. These were have been here since the 70s and 80s. Nothing has changed. In fact, I thank the authorities that this refectory has not been has not been destroyed, has not collapsed. Because of what I said earlier, under investment. Economic history has taught us that Nigeria was once the global leader in palm oil production, with at least 40% market share. Similarly, a number of us grew up to the fact that rice could be produced in large quantity in Abakaleki, in Benu, Kebi, Jigawa, and 16 other states in Nigeria. Today, the country is a net importer of these products with heavy implications on external reserves. With a population of over 180 million people, Nigeria is today struggling to achieve food security. Obviously, our prognosis shows that certain things went wrong. And we do not, as a country, have any choice to work hard to correct this wrong before it is too late. We wasted opportunities to be a giant in food production because we found oil. Perhaps if Nigeria had held firmly to its comparative advantage as a producer and net exporter of agricultural produce, while deploying its oil revenues into infrastructure development, our story would have been different today. Even with the global shocks that now confront us. I say this with all sense of responsibility. That if Nigeria had held strong to the comparative advantage that we have as a producer and exporter of agri produce, while at the same time holding strong to the strength that God has given us 
as a producer and exporter of food oil, Nigeria will be better today. I give you an example. Norway is the country of a population less than 6 million people. Norway produces fish. They consume the fish and export the fish to Nigeria and we spend our foreign exchange to import fish from Norway. Right? We can produce fish because God has given us coastal water through which we can produce fish. Norway also is an oil producer and exporter. Any lot of foreign exchange from export of food. Norway only has over 900 billion dollars as reserves in the sovereign wealth form. Norway invests its, its, own, its own foreign exchange from oil on infrastructural development. That is a country that has taken advantage, comparative advantage, of its agricultural prowess and also taking strength in the fact that God gave them proof and took advantage of it. Perhaps if we did the same, we would not be in the situation we are today. What then can we do to remedy this situation? Is it our inflexible destiny or collective decision to rely so much on other countries for our basic needs? What kind of future do we really want as a people? What legacy do we want to bequeath to our children and generations to come? They will just simply abuse us that we, we wasted the opportunities that we had. I do not think that one policy decision from any arm or agency of government can answer all these questions. But in the ensuing paragraphs, I will proffer my suggestions and present a vigorous defense of central bank's current policies, which are geared towards engendering growth and curbing inflation. We need to rebuild our infrastructure. Investing in basic infrastructure, including roads, bridges, airports, railways, and information technology, it's not only good in terms of immediate job creation, it acts as a catalyst to the movement of goods and services across the country. A recent World Bank study estimates that sub Saharan Africa's infrastructure deficit, especially in power and transportation, is costing us about 25 percentage points of GDP growth per annum. This story also indicates that about $93 billion per year will be needed to tackle the region's infrastructural challenges. Although Nigeria has relatively better infrastructure than many of our African peers, our core stock of infrastructure is estimated at about 25% of GDP. Given that most middle-income countries in Nigeria size have core infrastructure of about 70% of GDP, the African Development Bank estimates that we have an infrastructural funding gap of $300 billion. Obviously, our fiscal resources alone will be inadequate to finance this gap. Therefore, it is critical that we begin to consider innovative mechanisms and ideas to do so. We need to explore opportunities for public-private partnerships, for similar opportunities in infrastructure projects that can offer, that will offer lucrative returns to investors and help drive economic growth across the country. We need to pursue growth-enhancing fiscal policy. More than ever before, it is now critical to concentrate our best efforts in ensuring that fiscal policy is targeted at improving productivity of labor, 
increasing disposable income for workers and deploying resources to create an enabling environment for investors. We need to look at how fiscal policy can help stimulate household consumption and business investments. These two make up more than 85% of Nigeria's GDP by expenditure. We need to jumpstart agriculture and agribusiness. Agriculture remains the largest employer of labor in Nigeria and contributes about 24.2% of our GDP. In addition, a good share of demand for foreign exchange today go directly to importing agricultural produce. So, the CBN has both a direct and indirect rationale to ensure that this sector is revived in a significant way. In this regard, we are gratified that Central Bank's anchor program, program, together with other initiatives like the Commercial Agriculture and Credit Scheme, the NASA, are providing, are proving to be successful in several states. To date, the bank has committed close to 29 billion in our corporate program with active participation across 24 states of the Federation. In Kevin, over 78,000 smallholder farmers are now cultivating about 100,000 hectares of rice farms. It is expected that over 1 million metric tons of rice will be produced in that state alone this year. The positive impact of catalyzing the domestic agricultural production is that we will restore wealth and create employment in our rural communities. These were jobs that were exported to other countries while we impoverished our people. The CBA remains committed to doing more in the identified crops such as rice, maize, sorghum, tomatoes, cassava, cocoa, cotton, dairy, and groundwork. We also need to find ways to make land. I think we can consider a full implementation of 2003 Carbon Tax Act. This act stipulates that all cargoes and passengers in the inland and coastal waters being transported by ship and ferries built, owned, crewed, and manned by Nigeria. Contrary to requirements of this act, there are several foreign owned vessels providing shipping services locally. Out of about 600 ships that operate within our waters, only about 60 of them are owned by Nigerians and are mostly idle in violation of the act. Industry sources suggest that Nigeria may be losing as much as 2 trillion naira annually from this anomaly. In addition, to raise the revenue, a full implementation of the act will also spoil job creation, capacity building, and significant backward integration. This is just one out of many ideas on raising revenue. We need to pursue non-economic oil exports. From preliminary analysis of global trade trends and discussions with potential trade partners, it is now increasingly evident that Nigeria can benefit significantly from tapping into the market for certain goods which are in high demand. For example, the demand for halal mix and system across the Gulf Corporation Council countries is huge. In fact, we have credible information that the Saudis may need up to 120,000 heads of frozen goods or ship per week from Nigeria. Similarly, the demand for cashew nuts, shea nut butter across the world is rising. Nigeria has comparative advantage in all these products and can quickly tap into the vacuum created for the sharp fall in supply of these products from the air to major suppliers. From this, we can make foreign exchange to bolster our reserves while also creating jobs and engendering broad-based economic growth. We need to pursue import-reducing policies. 
And in view of the fact that our oil prices, that oil prices will remain low for a long period of time, it is clear to us that the FX revenue inflows will remain low with relatively low FX results for a while. Given this scenario, we need to take bold and decisive steps at fundamentally changing the structure of our economy. Of course, monetary policy alone cannot achieve this, but it must do its part. Throughout this speech, I have thought about the damaging effect of Nigeria's unsustainable propensity to import. In line with Winston Churchill's admonition to never let a good crisis go to waste, the senior believes that it is high time we started looking inwards and stopped supporting the importation of items that we can produce locally using Nigeria's scarce and hard end foreign exchange. In this regard, I must hasten to add that while they may seem controversial, variants of this policy have proven to be highly effective in other tribes and even here in Nigeria. For example, throughout the early days of South Korea's economic renaissance, the government intermittently used excessively stiff tariffs, quantitative restrictions, and prohibited inland taxes to effectively ban many items. In the Western Hemisphere, for example, the United States prohibits the import of generic Canadian drugs that are way cheaper than just as effective as those locally made in the United States. And for almost a decade now, the Indian retailers have been waging a war against their government's proposal to open up the retail sector to more efficient global players like Walmart. We all know how European governments have helped local taxi drivers in their battle against the new, less costly, and more efficient American taxi company, the Uber, a service that uses a smartphone app to get users taxis from the comfort of their location. And here at home, variants of these policies were used to achieve significant source sufficiency in cement, a product whose importation could have been cost in Nigeria over $3.2 billion in FX reserves annually. In effect, therefore, this policy needs to be supported not just in response to the pressure on the Naira, but as an opportunity to change the country's and economy's structure, resuscitate local manufacturing, and expand job creation for our teaming youth and for our citizens. Take red rice, take rice imports, for instance. Why should we keep allocating scarce efforts to rice importers when vast amounts of paddy rice of comparable and indeed better quality produced by our poor hard-working local farmers across the rice belts of Nigeria are wasted and farmers are falling deeper into poverty while we export their jobs and income to rice producing countries abroad. Few decades ago, Nigeria was one of the world's largest producers of palm oil. But today, we import nearly 600,000 metric tons of palm oil, while Indonesia and Malaysia combine export over 90% of global demand. The story is that Malaysians came to Nigeria, took our palm cannon to their country. They even took one of our professors, another one professor of yours, I don't know from which university, to Malaysia to help conduct research for the growth for them to grow palm oil or to develop their palm plantation industry. And today, Malaysia combined with Indonesia control 90% market share of the palm oil industry. Few decades, and these palm trees are there everywhere. 
What happened? What happened? The main revenue earner from the south, south, and southeastern part of the country those days used to be palm oil. The main revenue earner for the southwest in the 50s and in the 60s used to be cocoa. The main revenue earner from the northern part of Nigeria those days used to be ground up, cotton, and the rest of them. Under these circumstances, I believe it is appropriate and in fact expected that the CBM contribute its contribute to protecting the jobs and incomes of local farmers using some of the same principles that Western economies have used to justify the protection of their farmers through huge subsidies. We need to work hard to curb inflation. In order to tackle inflation, we must first understand what kind of inflation we have in Nigeria. Is it demand pull with too much money chasing few goods or cost push where supply constraints result in few goods in the marketplace? Our analysis at the CBN suggests that we have cost push inflation in Nigeria. Indeed, we currently have several supply constraints that can be christened the three problematic F's. Food, no habits, disease outbreak, Northeast crisis, etc. Fuels, high electricity, and PMS and kerosene prices, and foreign exchange, high demand, and low supply of foreign exchange. Given this analysis, it is easy to see why the CBN is doing a lot to ease these supply constraints. In response to recent calls by notable persons, and groups on the central bank to reduce the country's high lending rates. I think it is important that I share my view on this issue. Let me first state that I have, I have long been a believer in low interest rates. In fact, when I unveiled my ambition for the CBN on assumption of duty, as governor in June 2014, reducing interest rates was one of my cardinal priorities. Yet, it is important that we discuss this issue based on facts rather than politics and or emotion. First, interest rates are a veritable tool for curtailing inflation, and with inflation at over 16%, the CBI will be abjectly failing in one of its key mandates if it cut interest rates at this time. Second, for those who say that we need a rate cut to spur growth, we need to be reminded that high inflation is inimical to economic growth. Indeed, many empirical studies Concluding, con 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 uh, conducted at the CBN between 2014 and 2017, have estimated the threshold level for Nigeria at which inflation becomes significantly growth retarding to between 12 and 12, between 10 and 12.6 percent. What we're saying here is, if inflation based on models conducted, based on studies conducted. If inflation is above maximum 12.6%, no matter what you do to stimulate growth, it will certainly retard growth. With Nigeria at 16.1% today, one must question the judgment of cutting interest rates at this time. Finally, I think it is important to underscore that interest rates reflect not just the cost of capital, but also the cost of doing business. And so we need to also look at interest rates from the perspective of the lender. Given that most banks have to individually provide security, power, and other infrastructure, it is not surprising that some of these costs are passed on to customers 
in the form of high interest rates. Notwithstanding these facts, we won't continue to use moral solution to encourage commercial banks to be more considerate in interest rate charges of customers. Let me note at this juncture that one of the reasons the CBN ventured into development banking was to minimize the effects of high interest rates on customers, particularly in some select sectors of the economy, like coal manufacturing, agriculture, and micro small and medium enterprises. This push started in 1997 with the Agricultural Credit Guarantee Scheme, and since then, the CPN has intervened through various developmental initiatives, all at single digit interest rates. Today, the CPN has involved over 303 billion in 490 projects under the Commercial Agricultural Credit Scheme. The CPN has also disposed over 29 billion under the Anchor Brothers Program, 150 billion under the Small Scale and Medium Enterprise Program, 236.4 under the Power and Innovation Intervention Fund. In addition, through its refinancing and restructuring facility, the CPN has disbursed over 400 billion to coal manufacturers through the restructuring of their loans in deposit money banks into long-term facilities, thereby helping to stimulate the economy with immediate liquidity for growth of the manufacturing sector. Combined, these schemes have created over 6.7 million direct jobs and a lot more indirect jobs. We need strong policy coordination. Finally, in times like this, it is usually the need, there is usually the need for strong policy coordination between the key aspects of economic policy and policy making space. In Nigeria, this will include fiscal, monetary, exchange, and trade policies, which will be targeted at protecting farmers, companies, and industries that are committing resources to support government's drive to diversify the economy away from oil and fossil fuels. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not unaware of the short-term pains that Nigerians are going through at this time. But I urge all of us to see this as an opportunity to look inwards, diversify our economy, produce locally, and create jobs for our unemployed youths. We are a resilient, hardworking people. Since gold only glitters after it has gone through enormous heat, I am confident that out of these difficulties would come our very best ideas and decisions. We definitely cannot survive as a people by importing everything and anything. Even when we disagree about the way forward, we need to treat each other with respect and fairness. We cannot keep suspecting one another and impugning motives for people's actions. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that whatever you do, even in good faith, sometimes someone else would have a different idea. We should therefore never lose sight of what is important. We should remain resolutely committed to the cause and be motivated by the achievability of our desires to strengthen the macroeconomic management space and performance of our country. Fitting to end my speech, I will lean on the sagacity of Abraham Lincoln portrayed in these words. If often, it often requires more courage to dare to do right than to fear to do wrong. Hence, never let us be slandered from our duty, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction. Let us have faith that 
right makes might. And that in that, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Thank you for your kind attention.